On this week in Enterprise Tech, Mr. Curtis Franklin, Mr. Brian Chi join me. And in the era of digital threats, we're uncovering all the challenges and opportunities of cybersecurity recruitment. We'll talk about it. We're also going to dive deep in the heart of IT and cybersecurity. Ever wonder how businesses are reimagining their worlds with cutting edge technology? Well, today we have Scott Evers from Involta. He's going to discuss the revolutionary world of Enterprise Edge and the future of hyperscale cloud services. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set podcasts you love from people you trust this This is twit this is twiet this week in enterprise tech episode 564 recorded october 6th 2023 data is bigger in texas this episode of this week in enterprise tech is brought to you by bitwarden Get the open source password manager that can help you stay safe online. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by Duo. Protect against breaches with a leading access management suite providing strong multi-layer defenses to only allow legitimate users in. For any organization concerned about being breached and in need of a solution fast, Duo quickly enables strong security and improves user productivity. Visit cs.co slash twit today for a free trial. And by our friends, IT Pro TV, now ACI Learning. ACI's new solution, Insights, assists in identifying and fixing skill gaps in your IT teams. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners can receive up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution plan after completing their form. Based on your team's size, you'll receive a properly quoted discount tailored to your needs. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through the big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts. Start there by me, Mr. Brian Chi. He is our network expert, security expert. He's all around tech geek, and he is always busy. Chibert. What's been keeping you busy this week? I've been playing IoT. I've been using um, gear from Seed Laboratories. It's called the Wheel Node. Super, super simple little device. It's under $9 each. And then maybe double that when you start adding sensors. And the idea is I'm going to be deploying them at the Central Florida Fairgrounds so that we can get more intelligence in the HVAC system for our expo halls without having to go and pay the HVAC company mega bucks. Ought to be fun. Now you didn't uh, get stuck in any buckets this week, right? No, 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 no buckets this week, but I did finish up the fiber optics that I was doing. And um, of course, as I got down to the last fiber, I grab it to go and lace it into the, uh, fiber tray and it comes off in my hand so i had to cut them all off and start again what a drag at least you uh you know we're stuck in a tree so that's good <laughs> good week good, good week all around well we also have to welcome back mr curtis franklin he's principal analyst at md and again he's the man has the pulse on the enterprise and again always busy curtis what's keeping me busy this week well, this week, the, uh, some of the business has actually been due to good stuff. Uh, eagle-eyed viewers might note that I'm not in my normal office. I'm uh, off in Atlanta where we're visiting our son. Uh, that's been a pleasure. In the meantime, I've been writing a report on a particular company, uh, a company called Interpress, which does uh, threat uh, analysis and management that's as opposed to vulnerability or risk um so working on that got uh, several other reports coming up um fortunately no travel on the horizon but plenty of time spent on zoom calls uh you know it's uh, zoom is the new black or something like that i just uh spend all kinds of time on zoom um but i think I'd, i'm happier doing that than staying on an airplane all the time 
Well, thank you, Curtis. Speaking of lots of stuff going on, we definitely have lots to talk about. Now, in the era of digital threats, we are uncovering all the challenges and opportunities of cybersecurity recruitment. You don't want to miss our conversation because we have a mix of experience and wisdom there. As we're diving deep in the heart of IT and cybersecurity, we will be joined by Scott Evers from Envolta to discuss the revolutionary world of Enterprise Edge and the future of hyperscale cloud services. So definitely stay with us because we have lots more to talk about. But first, we have some enterprise news to send your way with our news blips. Atlassian has reported an exploit in its Confluence server and Confluence data centers. Attackers have taken advantage of a severe bug tracked as CVE 2023-22515, affecting versions from 8.0 to 8.5. One, if your Confluence instance is public facing, it's definitely a potentially risky there, allowing attackers the highest privilege of admin level access. Several clients have already reported incidents due to this zero day vulnerability. Atlassian quickly released updates for affected installations. Now, in, in an advisory, Atlassian mentioned that instances, especially those on the public internet, are exploiting, are exploiting and exploitable anonymously. They emphasize that just upgrading won't actually remove the intruders. IT teams must identify compromises, remove unauthorized admins, and assess damages. Lassian also hasn't disclosed specific specifics about this issue, but assured that the cloud sites are unaffected. They've provided a security advisory detailed affected versions, mitigation steps, and threat detection measures a primary recommendation is restricting the external network access and preventing access to the setup star endpoints on confluence in instances now rapid seven added their insights as well noting that the compromise indicators center around the setup star endpoints and their researchers highlighted that potential of the unauthenticated or authenticated remote elevation privilege gap that lets attackers establish admin accounts now i think that you need to take note here that it's not just an upgrade that's enough here. You must also have that common practice as an IT or security professional that you, quote, assume breach, right? That the offenders are already in the confounds of your network or they've already breached the service. And that means you need to take the steps to lock things down, remove access, and basically stop the bleeding. And if you haven't already, make sure you go and update your service. All right. So from our good friends over at Dark Reading, comes news that there are at least 100,000 industrial control systems, or ICS, exposed to the public internet around the world. And these control a host of critical operational technologies like power grids, water systems, and building management systems. According to the article, researchers at BitSight reached the 100,000 number by inventorying reachable devices that use the top 10 most popular and widely used ICS protocols well, protocols like Modbus, KNX, BACnet, Niagara Fox, and others. Now, the researchers say these reachable and vulnerable systems represent a global risk to physical safety, stretching to at least 96 countries. And the risk is not theoretical, as malware built to subvert power grids and incidents like the Colonial Pipeline malware attack show. Pedro Umbelino, principal security researcher at BitSight, notes that there are few, if any, reasons for this type of equipment to be directly really reachable via the internet, so the risk level seems like a soluble problem. In fact, if systems are directly behind a firewall or otherwise not internet-facing, then much of the risk of exploit is mitigated. The takeaway is that ICS owning organizations can inventory their protocol use and use that as a variable to identify risk and inform their operational technology or ICS security strategies. Companies obviously want to take the most immediately, immediate, most direct action against the vulnerable systems that are directly accessible from the internet, directly in the line of fire, if you will. Now, while 100,000 sounds like a bad number, and, and it is, it's worth noting that the level of ICS exposure has actually declined over time, even amid the move to smart OT environments and more digitization. For example, in 2019, the number of exposed ICS devices within the parameters of the study sat at nearly 140,000. So the news isn't good, but it's not as bad as it might be. So my uh, soapbox here is comes up to us from Wired Magazine. And the headline is Undersea Cables Are Carrying Scientific Secrets, which 
is kind of off topic, but that's all right. So the article is talking about using large scale time domain reflectometry and interferometry to detect minute movements in undersea cables in order to create a gigantic earthquake detection web. I'd like to highlight an older but potentially more flexible and less expensive detection system that not only can detect earthquakes but also tsunamis. The Aloha Cabled Observatory is 85 miles north of the island of Oahu and sits three miles underwater. Dr. Bruce Howe of the University of Hawaii School of Ocean, Earth Sciences and Technology is the principal investigator for this project and has been pitching the concept of adding some relatively simple and well understood sensors into the optical repeater packages used on existing undersea cables. Instead of needing an ex extensive development to add OTDR capabilities to shore stations and to the optical repeater packages, the system could easily be added to the repeaters of near future cables. Well, let's put this in the proper perspective. Several companies currently make a system that can be added to existing fences or buried underground. This is for you know, above water application. It uses the change in how light transmits through the cable to detect if someone is climbing a fence or walking across the ground. The concept has been around for decades and I've deployed such technology to help guard facilities around the world. The point I'm really trying to make is that we can already add earthquake and tsunami detection using tried and true existing technology. I'd like to also point out that tsunami detection is currently buoy based and are anchored in relative shallow waters. If we had mid-ocean tsunami and earthquake detection, we could possibly double or maybe triple the amount of warning time for our shoreline populations. The CVE 2023 4911 vulnerability has been cheekily dubbed Looney Tunables. Might not actually seem like an IT world ender, but its score, CVSS score, is actually 7.8, which means it's deemed important rather than critical. However, there's more to it that meets the eye. ZDNet describes the vulnerability as residing in the GNU C library's dynamic loader, leading to a buffer overflow. Now, here's the kicker. It's present in virtually all distributions of Linux. A cost threat research unit, the brains behind this discovery, revealed that it could be an exploit and it could be on by default in installations of Fedora, Ubuntu, and Debian versions. The sole beacon of hope, well, Alpine Linux, that's right, Alpine Linux remains unaffected. Now, given the sheer breadth of its impact, this vulnerability makes it worryingly straightforward for attackers to gain root access on almost all Linux systems. Putting it bluntly, this is bad news for our Linux community, right? Well, how do we get from here? How do we get here, right? This flaw traces back to actually April 20. 21 with the glibc 2.3's 4 release originating in that file and the dynamic loader now its trigger is the tunables environment variable that's right Qualys's emphasis here is that it's quote its misuse can broadly undermine the system performance reliably reliability and security the potential of turning the overflow into an extensive attack could jeopardize numerous systems especially the glibc's widespread linux presence now, the alarming part here, at least one exploit for this vulnerability is already in the wild. Now, the question is, what's the action plan? Well, of course, patch and patch very quickly. Industry bigwigs like Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, and Gen2 have rolled out updates already. Now, the, the base code here also has the necessary patch for the glibc library. For those who can't apply an immediate fix, Red Hat offers a script to mitigate the vulnerability by terminating specific set UID programs. Now, our recommendation, patch up, activate mitigation scripts, and shield any exposed IoT devices behind firewalls right away. And in fact, in the words of the legendary Porky Pig, that's all, folks. Well, folks, next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Bitwarden, the only open source cross-platform password manager anywhere, anytime. In fact, even Security Now's Steve Gibson has switched over, and we know Steve has some serious high standards, so that's a good thing. And with Bitwarden, all the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. In the summer of 2023, G2 Enterprise Grid Report, they solidified their position as the highest performing password manager for the enterprise, leaving competitors in the dust. Bitwarden protects your data and privacy by adding strong, randomly generated passwords for each account. Go further with their username generator, 
create unique usernames for each account or use any of the six integrated email alias services. You could log in with Bitwarn and decrypt your vault after using SSO on a registered trusted device, no matter and no master password needed. This new solution makes it even easier for enterprise users to stay safe and secure with Bitwarden. Transparently view all of Bitwarden's code available on GitHub. I've looked at it. Now, on top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed every year yearly, and the results get published right there on their website. Bitwarden is open source security that you can really trust. To share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 per month per user. Individuals always get Bitwarden's basic free account for unlimited passwords, upgrade anytime to a premium account for less than a dollar a month, or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. This is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Keep yourself and help your friends and family stay secure online with Bitwarden. Bitwarden offers a fully featured free plan for everyone, which now includes being able to use hardware security keys or pass keys as a form of two-factor authentication. Bitwarden envisions a world where nobody is hacked is the only password manager offering this strong security option for free. At Twit, where fans of password managers get started with Bitwarden's free trial of Teams or Enterprise Plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we thank Bitwarden for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, there is a unique conundrum happening in shaping the world of cybersecurity recruitment. That's right, recruitment. While there's a glaring shortage of trained professionals out there, automation is steadily taking over those essential entry level tasks. Now, this shift actually makes it really challenging for potential threat hunters to acquire hands on experience. Now, recent data from CyberSeek in collaboration with partners like NIST and CompTIA reveals that job postings demanding Prior cybersecurity experience soared at a rate of 2.4 times faster than the overall economy over the past year. However, the supply is very strained. Only 65 cybersecurity experts are in the workforce for every 100 open positions. Now, let's think about this in summary. It's a whopping 769,736 job openings in just a year ending this September. Now, CompTIA aptly highlighted the significance of these findings. In fact, they emphasize the need for more dynamic approaches to recruitment and career development, recognizing the challenges ahead. The interesting fact is the demand isn't just within the cybersecurity domain. That's right. Employers are eyeing potential recruiters with cybersecurity skills for roles like auditors, cloud architects, and tech support engineers. But there's a twist here. Reps from Tanium believe many employers set set unrealistic expectations. Sound familiar? Well, they argue that degrees aren't mandatory for most cybersecurity roles. Instead, they've had success actually hiring individuals by diverse backgrounds, like including teachers, mechanics, emphasizing curiosity and problem solving skills. Now, a rep from Cardinal Ops echoes this sentiment, suggesting a broader search criterion for hiring managers. He recommends considering candidates with backgrounds in fields like history, fraud investigations, and even music. Why? Because it's the traits like analytical thinking and keen eye for detail make an excellent cybersecurity professional. That means in a there's a definitely demand in the market and it's adaptability and open mind that just must might just bridge the gap with a talent gap here. We'll see what's going on. I do want to bring my co-hosts in because they have lots of experience here. Cheever, should organizations be looking for essentially a specific mindset here for that well, creative recruiting? Uh, re realistically, like any highly skilled um, profession or job, or whatever adjective you want to use, uh, a lot of this is stratified. You're going to have some people that need a lot more experience than others, depending on the type of job. Um, I'm a big, big fan of um, academics. And, you know, I've worked at a university for quite a while in a four year degree program, I think, uh, in my opinion, um, concentrates on critical thinking. It's not it's not designed to get you ready specifically for a p specific job. 
but teach you the critical um, thinking skills. Now, one of the things I wanted to suggest to the uh, hiring world is there used to be a lot of uh, concepts like practicum and internships. And if we have a market that is severely lacking in people with experience, maybe it's time the private sector tries to work hand in hand with academia. And that's what my lab did at the University of Hawaii. So uh, I actually specifically started looking for ex, you know, retired or disabled law enforcement um, professionals um, because they have the right mindset for the investigation. And I saw many, many, many positions where the grizzled old police detective that retired and had to walk with a cane was overlooked. And I keep thinking, gee, that, that person probably solved all kinds of crimes. That's basically cybersecurity. I'd rather teach them the skills than having to start and convince, say, a young person right out of a community college that I'm sorry, it's that's wrong, that's right. I, I want to have someone that already knows right from wrong and has the investigative skills. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop um, my soapbox, but I truly believe that a public-private um relationship is something we need if we want to start filling these job gaps. Right. Right. Now, I, Curtis, what about you, like, do you think that, that the whole concept of diversity that they're calling out here and thought and experience often leads to more, maybe more applicable uh, people to kind of fill these roles, people that can essentially broaden their thought process when it comes to specific cybersecurity strategies, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think cybersecurity is one of those areas where you can make an objective argument for the benefits of a diverse workforce. You know, if you look at cybersecurity and where our biggest um, problems have come from, it has been through a lack of imagination. Someone will always say, we never imagined that anyone would do this thing. Uh, great example would be Target. You know, this is several years ago, but if we recall the huge Target uh, exploit, that came in from an HVAC contractor. That whole thing started with the ICS um, thermostats. Um, and no one on the target security team ever imagined that that would be a point of vulnerability. To the extent that everyone on your security team looks alike and comes from the same background, it tends to maximize the possibility that you'll have these blind spots. So I think you're, you're exactly right. You know, the most important thing for entry level tier one analysts is going to be a mindset, someone who is curious, who's good at solving puzzles, someone who looks at patterns and sees what's different, all of these things. The, the real problem that I hear when I talk to cybersecurity professionals who are bemoaning this, this workforce lack is the disconnect that comes between security managers and HR because security managers often will say, oh, I'd love to have someone who has taken part in half a dozen capture the flag exercises. Uh, I'd rather have someone who was good at capture the flag than someone who had, you know, a fairly generic certification. But when the job openings get to HR, they start looking at ways that they can make a first cut on the stack of resumes that come in. And the easiest way to do that is through credentials, you know, diplomas, uh, certifications, uh, things like that. And, you know, let's also be be realistic here. I, and Lou, you mentioned this in the, the entry uh, to this. 
a an analyst with a couple of years, two to three years experience in most decent sized cities can be making mid hundred thousand dollar salary. And when you see a job offering that's looking for a tier two analyst with seven years experience, including specific experience in, you know, cloud and endpoint security and full stack this and, you know, all the starting salary, $63,000. That's a position that's going to go unfilled. Uh, unless you can find someone whose family has tied them tightly to that community, um, you're not going to draw some win. So, so there are a number of points of disconnect in the whole puzzle. But the important thing is that we have a gap of somewhere between 300 and 500,000 individuals between the number of openings that exist for trained cybersecurity professionals and the number of trained cybersecurity professionals. And if you talk to people at CompTIA, ISC Squared, Cybrary, um, know before any of the major training companies, they admit that this is something where there simply is no way to train ourselves out of this shortage. We, we simply don't have the training capacity and the pipeline to do it. So we've got to figure out other ways of getting people into those positions and frankly, some technology to help the people who are there be as effective as possible. And what do you think, Cheaper? Is there another pipeline that can improve the training here that that can help with this type of thing? Actually, I think there's a pipeline that a lot of um, people are ignoring. Um, I worked at a computer science program at the University of Hawaii, and one of the things we wanted to do, we wanted to offer more classes. We wanted to hire people to teach. Um, One of the problems I, I had trying to, you know, fill this gap was um, there were cyber professionals are making too much money. They don't want to teach. So that was one, one problem. The other problem is we didn't have the resources, you know, nowadays for any decent four year university to do a cybersecurity um, uh, program, you almost have to have a cyber range. And, you know, if you want to have, you know, red versus blue, you know, with white judging and, you know, so forth. Um, a cyber range is not cheap. So one of the things I like to throw out is one, write your cyber, uh, write your Congress critters. Um, Congress needs to think really, really hard about providing tax incentives for private industry to help the academic world um, start, you know, putting more people out, you know, we, if more universities were able to go and pump out kids that had some hands on, you know, play red team versus blue team on a cyber range. um, Suddenly we've got at least a little bit of experience under the belt when they start hitting the um, workforce. Um, I also strongly encourage the academics you know, grab those retired police detectives or FBI agents and so forth. Get the Leos involved um, because they've got a great set of skills to try and teach the next generation. And until we start doing that, um, I don't think we have a prayer of catching up. And one, one interesting thing, talk about untapped potential here. Like, I feel like a lot of these are talking about the fact that they're trying to recruit um, and, you know, obviously, I can tell you from experience that recruiting nowadays is hard. Trying to find, obviously, people externally, like you said, being very creative and how you're pulling candidates. And I want to get your guys' thoughts on this is, you know, a lot of organizations tend to not think about potentially training their internal organization, people who have the potential internally to, you know, work with maybe already standard professionals there and have them grow into these roles. Um, do you think that the need is so dire right now that they did not willing to do that? What do you guys think? Lou, Lou, can I jump in here? Yeah, absolutely, Scott. Welcome. Yeah, so, so one of the problems that has existed in security in the 20 plus years I've been in IT is that 
you know, a lot of enterprise security organizations grew out of networking organizations. So they're entirely focused on perimeter defense, what's going on in the network and the infrastructure layer. Application security has always been a second class citizen. But, you know, given the fact that with the advent of cloud, everything's becoming software defined, CICD is real, release velocities of, you know, 100 releases a month are real. Um, having your app dev teams more invested in the security process is a huge gap and a huge need. And I also think it's fertile ground, especially when you're talking about retooling and retraining your internal staff. So it's probably easier to backfill a competent application developer uh, who has moved in security into security than it is to find a good you know, cloud security person, so to speak. So I think a lot of organizations should be looking at their senior development staff and saying, hey, who here has shown an aptitude or a, a passion for security? And can we grow them into one of those roles? Yeah, I really like that. I, I like that a lot. In fact, we have lots of examples of this, um, you know, where I work, where we, you know, we'll have individuals will we'll look at their skill sets and then look at the problem sets in front of us and then offer them an opportunity to kind of go and and bridge their their um, uh, their knowledge gap and go learn about some new stuff to, to try to build things. And AI is one of them. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we have some AI gap and, um, you know, security is also another one. Uh, Curtis, you work with a lot of organizations out there, talk to a lot of them. Is this something that they're considering is, is like the internal processes? Oh, very much. And most of the leading training organizations have training packages specifically intended for this, and they encourage it. Um, <clears throat> many of them, in fact, will make the initial trainings. It's three to nine courses, for example, available free uh, for people who are interested in sort of trying it out to see if it's something that they're really interested in. So there's a tremendous amount of interest in this. Uh, a lot of companies are exploring it, although you start to get into the internal dynamics of the companies because, Lou, I'll, I'll say, you know, put this in, in yours. Let's say you've got a Cracker Jack developer how excited would you be to have them come to you and say, you know, I, I know that I'm a really good developer and make a great contribution, but what I really want to do is find bad guys. So I'm going to be leaving your team to go off into another building to do something else. You're probably going to be only so excited about that. I mean, sure, you'll put on a happy face, say, good for you. This is great for the organization all the time going crap, I've got to find a new developer. So, you know, there there is a dynamic there that has to be seen realistically. I will say that another thing that is happening, you have, uh, I had a conversation out at Black Hat with CompTIA, and they are starting to do some things where basically they will identify people outside of cybersecurity and try to get them into a cybersecurity path. You know, they, they make this available to them. And then they get companies looking for cybersecurity professionals to sponsor that person's training with the, the understanding that at the end of their training, they go to work for the company that sponsored them. And CompTIA, or since I've heard about this from other uh, organizations, the organization will say, we guarantee that on day one, they are ready to work. And we also guarantee that they will be there for a year to, to pick a, a random length of time. So you get the training organization that's also in some ways acting as a talent recruitment firm. And I suspect we're going to see more of that kind of hybrid training talent recruitment thing going on again because we have such a shortage and it's so critical that companies on both sides of the equation are willing to look at creative solutions to make things better. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate this. Good, good topic. Great, great topic. And I appreciate you jumping in, Scott. We'll definitely get back to you in just a moment because we have lots more interesting stuff to talk about with you as well. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that is Duo. Duo protects against breaches with a leading access 
management suite. Strong, multi-layered defenses and innovative capabilities only allow legitimate users in and keep bad actors out. For any organization concerned about being breached that needs fast protection, Duo quickly enables strong security while also improving user productivity. Duo prevents unauthorized access with multi-layered defenses and modern capabilities that thwart those sophisticated malicious access attempts and it increases authentication requirements in real time when risks actually arise there. Now, Duo enables high productivity by only requiring authentication when needed, enabling swift, easy, and secure access. They also provide an all-in-one solution for strong MFA passwordless, single sign-on, and trusted endpoint verification. Duo helps you implement zero trust principles by verifying users and their devices. Start your free trial and sign up today at cs.co slash twit. That's cs.co slash twit. And we thank Duo for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of this show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twirai. Today, we have Scott Evers, Enterprise Architect of Envolta. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Now, first, I would like to say I really enjoy talking to enterprise and solution architects because they are the people who are in the trenches. They work with customers to take them to, you know, to kind of lead them in the right direction, to take them to the right success uh, and you, you know, to kind of overcome their unique challenges. But I know we have lots to talk about there, but before we get to that, we have a complete spectrum of experiences when we come to our audience. And some of them love to hear people's journey through tech and, and their origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a journey through tech and what brought you to, to Involta? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to keep it under three hours because uh, it's a, a long and, and diverse background. But uh, to be honest, I, I actually um, had career aspirations of being a physicist. So my degree uh, is in physics, but you know, I, I wanted to grow up to be Sheldon Cooper, but while I was in uh, college, uh, I had to fight the collegiate IT department because the only way they would let you on the, the campus network was if you were running Windows 3.1. I've dated myself quite a bit. And, you know, I wasn't about to downgrade from Windows 95 to Windows 3.1. So I spent uh, an embarrassing amount of time trying to figure out how to, how to bypass and get on the network with Windows 95. Um, managed to do that, but that kind of sparked my passion in, in IT. So, um, you know, when I was still in college, I ended up getting a, a part-time job as a, a mainframe operator of all things for a large uh, a local employer, um, you know, delivering backup tapes around the facility, you know, handling print offs of reports. It wasn't very glamorous, but I, I got my foot in the door with this IT organization. Um, did well enough at that uh, position to parlay that into an internship, which, you know, uh, in my early days of IT, I thought I want to be a system administrator. I have no desire to be a developer pounding out lines of code all day. Um, surprisingly, my internship was exactly that. It was software development. So, um, you know, we had a, a number of uh, consultants in doing development for an internal application uh, at the time. And when that contract budget ran out, they had no one to uh, take on the burden of maintaining and, and enhancing that code base. So uh, they kind of stuck me the intern in to garner what I could from those, uh, from those consultants and um, really take over that code base and management of that application uh, upon their departure. So that's, that's how I got my foot in the door and my, my start of my career. Uh, so did a fair bit of uh, you know app dev in the early days, but because of the systems I were was working on, they were security based systems. Uh, we weren't allowed, or we didn't have the desire to have the traditional support teams within the organization have access to those systems. So I ended up being my own DBA, my own uh, IIS administrator. Uh, actually, was the first Active Directory administrator for the the company. This is in 1999, so a long time ago. Um, or maybe early 2000. Yeah, early 2000. Um, so did system administration as well as app development. I like to tell people I was the uh, originator of DevOps, even though what I did was nothing like modern DevOps, but I did development and operations. So, um, you know, worked on that um, uh, solution and in that space for quite a while in my early career. Started out um, using the Microsoft technology stack, .NET development, IIS, and, and SQL Server. Uh, we ended up 
acquiring a um, commercial application to replace our homegrown code base at some point, uh, which the application was basically a framework on which to build a new application. So ended up doing a bunch of Java development in those days, um, some Oracle database administration as we switched technology strat, uh, stacks. So got, got the full gamut of those experiences years and years ago. But then yes. because those applications were all security based, I got pulled into our security organization. Um, never, uh, and, and this is where I uh, have passion for developers becoming security professionals because I've, I've sort of lived that path and walked that path. And I, I think it's a great uh, transition to make, but uh, ended up doing some, some um, you know, layer seven gateway uh, administration, API gateways, uh, uh, WAFs, et cetera. And because of those rotations, uh, ended up getting a security architecture role within that organization. And that was right around the time that public cloud really started to become a thing. So my first public cloud project was um, helping migrate the organization from Lotus Notes as a productivity suite to G Suite, uh, which you can imagine was quite the transition. Yes. Um, but you know, I, as the security architect assigned to it, I had to identify risks, understand what the proper configuration of that platform was. Um, you know identify and, and help to build mitigations to those risks, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that kind of sparked my passion for public cloud services. So shortly after that started to do a fair bit of work with AWS, um, some other, some other SaaS based and PaaS based uh, solutions. You have quite, quite the uh quite the background here like i i, I would say that i was definitely right when it said you guys are the ones that definitely can go in and jump in the trenches and help find uh security and and other issues now speaking of identifying risks i'm always curious are you seeing commonalities you know obviously most organizations have a bunch of unique challenges right they all have their own unique challenges whether it's moving to hybrid cloud moving to moving to uh, to the cloud digital transforming securing things that kind of thing are you seeing some commonalities across the spectrum of just what most organizations are challenged or what kind of facing facing challenges they have uh you know specific to security i think it harkens back to um you know my comments earlier and that is a lot of security organizations are ill prepared to handle a software defined world so um you know i i, I come from a background where a policy is written before anything is deployed to production security has to review it they have the the big battle axe to be able to say, no, this isn't going live this week. Um, and that model obviously doesn't scale when you start to talk about, you know, increased release velocities when you start to talk about CI, CD. So I think DevSecOps is a big gap in a lot of organizations to this date, even though the concept's been around for years, it's not something that most organizations have really gotten their head around. Um, I think in general, uh, you know, I see a lot of organizations struggling to move forward and innovate and take advantage of new technologies that the market is presenting while still maintaining all of the legacy that they have to deal with. So uh, there's this, this strange dichotomy of, you know, I've got a thousand applications in my organization all running on VMs in my data center. But then again, I have these, you know, analytics opportunities to go leverage cloud services to garner those great insight to do AI. Everyone's talking about AI these days, right? So, um, you know, how do they balance those and how do they operate as that multimodal organization I see as a common challenge. Now, going back to what you're saying, like most organizations obviously grapple with the need for speed, responsiveness, kind of going more specific into technology. How do you envision the kind of the future of what we call operating at the edge? Do you see some way of effectively integrating, let's say, hyperscale cloud services to edge operations. What do you see there? How, how can organizations do this? Well, it's interesting because most enterprises have been operating at some definition of the edge for their entire history, right? If you have an on-prem data center in your facility, that's a definition of edge. Um, the challenge is when cloud became you know, prominent in the industry, everyone wanted to centralize into cloud uh, because of the ease of use, the ease of adoption, the potential for it to be cost effective, you know, stable, all those illities that we associate with cloud. Uh, and they started to ignore or abandon their existing edge footprint. Now they're starting to realize that, hey, not all workloads are a good fit for a centralized cloud environment. Some have to operate at the edge or are better 
to operate at the edge. The problem is in today's market, the experience, the cloud-like experience that has drawn people to, um, you know, cloud providers doesn't exist at the edge. So you may be able to do a fair job as an enterprise of managing your workloads and your deployments and your infrastructure across your locations, but you're going to invest a lot of time, resources, and focus into doing that. There's not a there's not a provider out there that can necessarily give you the easy button to manage your workloads distributed across your locations uh, in quite the same way you could do it in a centralized cloud environment. Right. Well, we definitely have a lot more to talk about here. And I do want to bring my co-host back in. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech. And that's our friends at IT Pro TV who are now called ACI Learning. 94%, 94% of CIOs and CISOs agree that attracting and retaining talent is increasingly critical to their roles, right? And we just talked about this. With today's IT talent shortage, ensuring your team's skills are up to date is more important than ever. 87% of companies say they have skill gaps in their employees. It's not easy figuring out the skills gap. It can be almost overwhelming, but listen, it doesn't have to be. ACI Learning now offers insights, a revolutionary skills gap analysis tool to guarantee you that the training you're providing is actually working. Now, in a quick one-hour assessment, ACI Learning's insights will allow you to not just see, but understand and fix the skills gaps on your IT team. Now, this is the solution IT managers have really been waiting for. Now, with insights, identify specific skill gaps in your employees and see where your team's weaknesses actually lie. Empower your team with personalized training to fill those gaps. Generic blanket-based training is always waste time and money. We know that. Now, insights offer detailed solutions, support, and strategy by issuing recommendations and training plans for individuals and your whole team. Compare results against other organizations so you know where you stand. Test skills and close the gaps with practical labs that allow trainees to focus on the skills they need most. ACI Learning helps you retain your team and entrust them to thrive while investing in the security of your business. More than 7,200 hours of content are available with new episodes added daily. And ACI Learning stomps its competitors with a 50% higher completion rate. These are the training solutions your business has been waiting for. Future-proof your team and company with insights from ACI Learning. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners can receive up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan after completing their form. Based on your team's size, you'll receive a proper quote discount tailored to your needs. And we thank ACI Learning for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Scott Evers, Enterprise Architect of Involta. We talk a lot about enterprise computing, edge computing, but I do want to bring my co-host back in because they have a lot of experience in the industry, and I'm sure they have some questions. Let's go first. Curtis, Chick, Keeper. I'm I'm happy to take off first. Um, and Scott, you've got some interesting things you're talking about. One of the things that, that I'm curious about over the past few years, we've heard an awful lot about data sovereignty. You know, not only that that data exists under the control of a company, but where the storage devices physically sit is a, a, an important consideration for many jurisdictions when it comes to legal and regulatory issues. <clears throat> is this something that you still have a lot of conversations about? Or is data sovereignty now at a point where it's a solved problem that that just kind of happens because everyone knows what it's all about? Uh, absolutely, it's definitely a challenge that some of our, our customers face. And I, I have these conversations on a fairly regular basis. Um, you know, uh, part of my background, you know, I worked in the defense industrial base. And so U.S. export controls was a, a big data sovereignty issue. So if I have a schematic for a weapon system that can't leave the grounds of the United States. Um, so so been familiar with that for for a large part of my career. Um, you know, I think at the national level, a lot of the sovereignty issues have been addressed, um, you know, thinking about. I have a desire to adopt a particular cloud provider. They happen to exist in that region or that geographic boundary. And so it's largely a non-issue for me. But I think where we're seeing organizations still struggle is 
within the United States when we get to state level data sovereignty requirements. So, uh, for example, Texas is notorious for liking to do business in Texas and uh, not all the hyperscalers have regions in Texas. So there's a particular customer I worked with um, that, you know, their their market is state um, governments and they wanted to do business with Texas. Uh, well, their their application stack was targeted towards AWS, so they had a real challenge because AWS doesn't have a region in Texas. So they actually had to re-architect their application stack and back away from that and containerize it to give them that portability. And so they had to sub-optimize their architecture in certain regards, couldn't take advantage or depend on certain uh, platform services they would, li would have liked to have consumed because of their data sovereignty requirements. With that, and you mentioned the the hybrid environment, which, and I, I think hybrid has now become pretty much standard for a lot of organizations. The idea that everything you do is going to live on one cloud service provider is just uh, not realistic. Mm -hmm. But from the cloud service provider standpoint, how aware do you have to be about the requirements and the capabilities of other cloud providers in order to, to help your customers be successful? You know, I, I think, let me maybe pivot a little bit on my response and, and answer a slightly different but related question. Um, you know, I think a lot of organizations that I work with when they think about approaching cloud, which, you know, cloud provider is right for me, how am I going to move? Um, you know, the, it's an IT organization who's never really thought about individual applications. They serve infrastructure, they serve operating systems to their, um, their application team brethren. And, you know, that they're looking at moving or adopting cloud services from that perspective. But at the end of the day, you know, a, a cloud fit assessment really comes down to the individual workload. So you should be analyzing the application and what really makes sense for that application. Does it belong in a hyperscaler? Does it belong in a private cloud? Does it belong on prem? Um, you know, what advantages can I realistically garner and how do I need to do that? Can I do a lift and shift? Do I have to refactor an application? You know, kind of that six R's methodology of, of analyzing your workload before you move. Um. Well, when you're analyzing the workload, one of the things that in my world we end up talking about a lot is the notion of shared responsibility when it comes to security. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I still hear companies being confused about, you know, where the lines are drawn between the part of the overall infrastructure that I'm responsible for as a customer versus what my provider is going to take care of on their end. How, first of all, is this something that you still have conversations about with customers? And second, have, you know, is it something that you think is going to be a, a conversation for the long term or are customers beginning to understand where those lines logically lie? It, it is something I still have conversations about on a fairly regular basis. And unfortunately, I don't know that there will ever be a clear cut answer. Uh, it'll never be a completely solved problem. And quite honestly, it's it's driven by compliance and legal liability, right? Um, you know, no attorney worth the salt is ever gonna give an absolute statement, uh, especially in a public forum. Uh, to the gener uh, general industry to say, this is what you're responsible for, this is what you must do. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what organizations are left to figure out. What must I do to maintain compliance? What must I do to effectively mitigate any sort of liability risk that I may have? Um, and, you know, absolutely, you can rely on your service providers, your cloud providers, and that shared responsibility model to help you get there. But when it gets into the the detailed questions around, okay, you know, I'm consuming, for example, S3 or Azure object storage, um, you know, they're responsible for firewalling off that service. They're responsible for protecting against, um, you know, sort of internet driven data breaches, but I must configure the um, must configure the service correctly. I must not enable public access. Um, you know, those are, 
pretty clear delineations, but when you get into the details of, well, what happens if I think I configured it properly according to their documentation, but someone still gets access, who's, who's on the hook for that? And that's something that will uh, likely continue to be litigated and argued about for the foreseeable future. Very good. Well, Scott, I've got, I'm ready to turn you over to Brian, but before I do, I've got one more critical question to ask. You know, we keep referring to hyperscale architectures. Uh, to what extent do you think we call them hyperscale because we've all got tired of trying to remember the next larger Greek prefix for, uh, for size? <laughs> uh, you know, I just use it as shorthand for, uh, for saying Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, right? Uh, it, the, when you when you talk about them 30 or 40 times a day like i do uh you, you gotta abridge that but um yeah i'm not sure that directly answers your question but yeah it's, it's just my short hand well i wanted to go pivot a little bit and start we, we've been as an industry we have been belly aching about lack of staffing lack of people trained how we want now, when I just got out of college, I'm going to show my age here. Um, I was recruited by Electronic Data Systems of Ross Perot fame. And they had a program. If they hired you, you'd sign a $20,000 promissory note. Once you get, you go through their school, then you're a junior engineer. They knock down some of the promissory note. You become a regular engineer, knock down a promissory note. And when you run a project, by yourself and it gets completed, they wash it and tear it up. Is this the kind of thing we have to do? Because you guys do a lot of services. It, when I first read the description, it sounded more like a um, general consulting firm, but you guys got started in co-location. Mm -hmm. As an industry, so here's the actual question. As an industry, do we need to take those kinds of radical approaches to get people into the vacancies that we desperately need you know i i don't think so and, and i'll say ross perot they really broke the mold with that guy so um i'm not surprised that he had a, a promissory note as part of his onboarding uh process but um you know there's nothing worse in an organization than an unengaged employee right so if you have some sort of penalty for them moving on uh, of, of course, you'd like to retain, um, you know, your your employee base. You make investments, uh, especially early in in individuals' careers, into you know building their value and, and upskilling them. And you want to be able to harvest that value. But the way to do it is with the carrot rather than the stick. Because if you if it's the stick, you're you're going to have them be disengaged, and you're better off if they're not there to begin with. Um, you know, in Volta, one of the one of the many services we offer is uh, outsourced service desk function, and so uh, we use that in a lot of cases as a feeder for um, you know recent graduates to to come in and get into the industry, and then upskill them and build them from there, and try to move them into um, you know into more advanced roles within the organization. You know, a lot of times that works, and it works well. Sometimes, you know, there's uh, it's a competitive market out there. People will have opportunities and they'll leave. What we like to see though, more than anything, is if an employee departs, they come back, right? So we always try to leave on good terms and we've, you know, we've seen a fair bit of that. Um, you know, I, I think a, a great thing about Involta is our culture. You know, we really invest in our people. We make them feel welcome. We make them feel important and enabled and empowered within the organization. Uh, and, and that really, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, but what we've seen is, is, you know, certain individuals, high performing individuals go chase an opportunity, understand that maybe the grass isn't really greener. Um, you know, the, the culture may be lightning in a bottle and then they want to come back and, and we're happy to have them. So I think really, you know, how do you, how do you make your organization an attractive place for people to, to spend their careers? And once you've got that nut cracked, you don't need to, to come in with a stick. Okay. Well, how about this? How about I ask you to peer into your crystal ball and if you could talk directly to the kids that are the, the people that are coming into our industry or changing industries, what kinds of things should they be um, looking at 
you know, what kinds of homework should they do? Um, what are the skill gaps that you're seeing in your new hires? Um, uh, I, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, DevOps, DevSecOps, right? Um, and, you know, uh, w- one of the, the things I do is I participate in, in uh, uh, local community colleges uh, advisory board, their industry advisory board. And, you know, one of the one of the agendas I've, I've, you know, pushed with them is that, OK, in your system administration um, coursework in that program, uh, you know, you're seeing you're you're definitely training people well on current technologies that are, you know, big in, in industry, VMware, you know, uh, uh, Cisco, whatever the case may be. Um, but if they're, you know point and click, run the occasional command system administrators, um, when they graduate, they're gonna be competing for an ever shrinking portion of the job market. And there are a lot of very seasoned people out there, a lot of experienced, um, you know, very qualified administrators uh, out there in the environment um, that are gonna be competing for these jobs. And someone with a, you know, two year degree or a certificate who's early in their career is gonna struggle to compete with those. Where the gap is is someone who can automate those processes. Uh, so if you can, you know, if you understand Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, pick your technology, uh, and you can you can be a force multiplier within a system administrator organization to to do more with less time. You're going to give yourself a leg up over you know potentially someone who's got 20 years in the industry. Well, with anything, with any great show, time flies. And this, this one's no excuse, definitely for sure. Scott, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me, guys. Great conversation. Now, well, before we before we let you go, we did want to give you a chance to maybe tell the audience at home where they can learn more about Envolta, where they can get in touch with you. Uh, yeah, Envolta.com. Um, I, I'm sure there's a way of publishing my contact information, but uh, hit Envolta.com. Um, you'll get a sense for who we are as an organization, the the plethora of things we do and the, the ways we can help. Thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best thing enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my wonderful co-host. Starting with everyone, Mr. Brian G. Chebert, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? Actually, this is one of the things I'm playing with. It actually has a wheel node inside. It actually plugs directly in. And um, that's a pa- um, passive infrared um, sensor. So I can actually count the number of people walking by in a hallway or something. And I can also grab temperature and humidity. And that was a very simple, very, very inexpensive occupancy sensor um, because we needed to go and find out are we actually leaving the air conditioning on in the top floor of a building for no one? So IOT doesn't necessarily need to be complicated. Um, the wheel system that I'm using is actually drag and drop. And then I use node red to harvest all the data and then push that up uh, to Google spreadsheets. Um, Lots of fun, and this is going to be yeah. Sorry, Lou. I, I see you making faces. It could just as easily be into the Microsoft cloud, you know, Azure. Easy. But the whole the whole idea is I'm trying to lower the bar so that organizations like the Central Florida Fairgrounds can afford to go and make their environment smarter without having to spend a lot of money. So I've got a community college kid that I'm trying to convince that he needs to um, bone up on a lot of the emerging topics. And uh, we're going to try and see how well he can do this and see if he really did study in his Node.js classes. Anyway, if you want to hear about this kind of goofiness that I'm doing, uh, I'm still using Twitter, aka X. Uh, My handle is ADV. N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. That's a leftover from my University of Hawaii days. I also would love to hear your show ideas, comments, questions, and so forth. I am Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. You can also use twiet at twit.tv, which will go and throw it Throw that email to all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your show ideas. Everybody be safe. 
I love that cheaper. Work harder. Actually work smarter, not harder. I love that. Thank you very much. Well, we also think of our own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, I've got a new report on insurance and cyber insurance as part of managing risk coming out for our subscribers at Omnia. I will also have a couple of small things coming up on LinkedIn. Speaking of which, if people want to follow me, they can do so on LinkedIn, where I am mysteriously listed as Curtis Franklin. Uh, I am also on X as KG4GWA and on Mastodon, KG4GWA at mastodon.sdf.org. Um, would love to hear from members of the Twyatt Riot. If you've got questions, concerns, uh, just random thoughts about cybersecurity in the enterprise, please look me up on one of these social media services and let me know. Thank you, Curtis. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to catch up on your enterprise news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twy. There it is. There you find all the amazing back episodes, of course, the show notes, codes, information, guest information. But more importantly, there next to those videos, that's right, right there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Plus, another way to support the show is you may have heard Club Twit. There it is. It's a members only ad free podcast service and you get a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. And it's only $7 a month. And there's a lot of great things that come with Club Twit. But one of them is exclusive access to the members only Discord channel, a Discord server, lots of channels on there. You can chat with hosts, producers. There's lots of separate discussion channels, lots of special events. So lots of fun stuff. Join Club Twit. Be part of that movement. Go to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, corporate group plans are also, also available. That's right. Corporate group plans for Club Twit. It's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast. And it starts with five members at a discount rate of $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you like there. It's a really great way for your IT teams, your developers, your tech teams to stay up to date with all of our podcasts. And it's just like the regular membership as well. You can get access to that Twit Discord server as well as that Twit Plus bonus feed. And of course, also remember there's family plans. That's right. $12 a month. You get two seats, $6 each per month. So lots of great options. Definitely join Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. And after you subscribe, and download the links. Of course, impress your family members, your coworkers, your your friends with the gift of Twy. Because we have a lot of fun on this show. We talk a lot about fun tech topics. And I guarantee they'll find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share the gift of Twy with them. And if you're available on Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. You can watch the live stream. That's at live.twit.tv. Come see how the pizza's made, all the behind the scenes, all the banter before and after the show. We have a lot of fun. So definitely join us live. And if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the amazing IRC channel as well. We have an IRC chat room. You can go to the web page is irc.twit.tv and you can log into there right, right away and you can jump into the Twit Live channel and we can be with all the folks in there. So lots of fun stuff as well as you watch the show live. Now, I definitely want you to reach out to me because I want to hear all your show ideas. I want to hear all your tech ideas, everything. Just hit me up at x.com slash Lou MM. I'm also Lou MPM on threads. I'm also Lou MM at twit.social. So lots of great ways to, to hit me up. Of course, also LinkedIn as well. If you want to message me there, I got lots of great conversations last week from people there. So definitely hit me up there. If you want to know what's going on my dur during my normal work week, definitely check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There it is. The latest, greatest ways for you to make your office suite more productive for you by customizing it. And of course, you have if you have Microsoft 365 right now, you can open up Excel. And on the Automate tab, on the Automate tab in Excel on the ribbon there, you'll see the Automate tab. You can customize your office experience by recording macros and actually code in JavaScript, TypeScript, and generate uh, Power Automate flows with that. Be able to edit your documents and bring data into your documents by using automation. So just like Brian was talking about, so definitely check that out because we have fun and interesting stuff there as well. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. Of course, thank you to all the staff and engineers at Twit. And of course, thank you to Mr. Brian Chi one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our Tyler's producer. He does all the show bookings and the plannings before the show. So thank you, Chibert, 
for all your support. And of course, before we sign out, thank you to the editor for today because they cut out all of our mistakes. Thank you very much. Plus our TD for today, the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. Thank you for all your support, sir. What's uh, what's happening this week on Twitter? Hey, thank you, Mr. Lou. Well, this week it was a lot of fun, uh, in particularly in Club Twit. I had a good time being able to sit down with the one and only Mr. John Scalzi. I got an advanced copy of his book and was able to do an interview with this prolific New York Times bestselling uh, sci-fi author. And I got to tell you, that interview was a lot of daggum fun. And um, I hope to continue to do more interviews like that. But yeah. Check us out, twit.tv slash club twit, baby. Fantastic. Thank you, man. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresco, just ramming you. If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. Thank you.